Hey guys, how's it going? Well, I want to do a real quick video because I got a guy over on uh, Watch Woman 65's last video uh, in a conversation about, and of course, it was, it's always the same thing that they act like they don't know anything to get you to talk to them, and then they uh, go into what their real reason or their real uh, motives are behind their them commenting. It's always the same thing. It never changes. Uh, it's not even not even a deal. It's not even surprising. They think they're doing something and they're not. But he has a problem with the uh, rider on the white horse, the Antichrist, and also the armies that are coming back with Jesus. That was the initial question. His name is Daniel I or Daniel 1. I'm assuming it's Daniel 1. I don't know. But uh, he's an idiot. He accuses me of being arrogant, yet he's showing a ton of arrogance. And he really showed it when he gave his comment about Revelation 19 and Revelation 6, that the two riders on white horses are the same person. I told him, I said, no. I said, and you're getting near heresy because now you're comparing Jesus with the Antichrist. You need to look at the details. Well, I'm going to do a video for you, Daniel, and hopefully you watch it because I'm having problems with my internet and it's hard for me to comment back and forth because things aren't resetting and I'm missing a lot of his comments. So... I'm going to do this instead because we're going to show this. Now, the initial question was about the armies that come back with Jesus. If you read in Revelation chapter 19, you see the army being described, the bride. And I've done videos on this. The bride is wearing a very simple, clear description of what she's wearing. You go down a couple of verses and here's Jesus coming back and the armies of heaven are wearing the exact same thing. That fine linen is only for the bride. Nobody else gets to wear that. They just wear white robes. So there's the army. Now you can go into Joel uh, 2, I think, and Joel 2 describes this army. Then you go into Psalm 145, and you see uh, another uh, simple description of that army and what they get to do. That's us. And he had a problem with that. But his big thing was Revelation 19 and Revelation chapter 6. We're going to go look at it. So in Revelation chapter 6, and I'm going to show you, here's the little details that tell you who we're dealing with here. Because I, I, I kind of get the impression a lot of people think this, and it's incorrect understanding. So he opened the first seal. In verse 2 it says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. That's the only verse that we have that talks about this, this rider on the white horse. Now, you go over to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened. Where did that happen at the first seal? Didn't. And behold, a white horse. There's one similarity. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. That wasn't in the first seal. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Well, that wasn't in the first seal either. It just said he went out to conquer. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. The guy in the first seal only had one crown, and somebody gave him that crown. Nobody gave him this crown. He earned this crown. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. That wasn't in the first seal. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. The guy in the first seal didn't have a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. The guy in the first seal didn't have that name. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That wasn't in the first seal. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. What did the guy in the first seal have? A bow? It never said he had a sword. Not even close. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. None of this is in the first seal. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So tell me how this is the same guy that's in the white horse in the first seal. Or the, yeah, the first seal. Only one thing, only one aspect matches between these, what was it, six verses and the one verse in Revelation chapter 6. Only one thing matches, and that's the white horse. Nothing else matches. Everything else is completely different. The first seal is the Antichrist. 
chapter 19 is Jesus. Now, if you're one of those people that believe that that's both talking about the same people, you better be careful because you're at a point of heresy. You're comparing Jesus and the Antichrist to being the same person. That's wrong. This is completely wrong understanding. And any biblical scholar will tell you Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 is the Antichrist. He is a political leader. That's why he has a bow with no arrows. That's why he has a crown given to him. That means he was proclaimed a king. Jesus was king from the very beginning. And any biblical scholar, anybody who studied, anybody worth their salt, will tell you Revelation 19 verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, five more verses than the Revelation chapter 6, is describing our Lord and Savior. And much of this description in these six verses you can find elsewhere in the Old and the New Testament. So if somebody who thinks they know what they're talking about, and I know who this guy is, he's a millennial, he's a guy who's been a Christian one to three years, he thinks he's got it all figured out, he doesn't know anything because he hasn't read the Bible. To him, all this is the same thing. He's not looking at the little details. He's not rightly dividing. But to use false pretenses to open up a dialogue and then to start talking smack to the person that's trying to show you the scriptures. You're now making yourself look like a fool. This is too easy to prove this. This is too easy to go to these scriptures and say, okay, look, what, is the, what does the scripture say? Well, clearly Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 gives a, an extremely simple, short description. One verse. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 16, six verses, gives it a completely different description. When you see a different description, it's two different things. You don't, It's not the same thing. You can't compare them. Nowhere in Revelation chapter 19 is it, does it say Jesus has a bow. Nowhere. Nowhere. Now, as far as the armies go, verse 14, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Let's see. Uh, where is it at? Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 14, And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Hello? Hello? Who is that? That's the bride. That's the church. Now, let's go look at the army thing again. I want to make sure I prove this completely, which I've already done. Psalm 149. Scroll down a to the bottom down here in verse 6 let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment this honor have all his saints praise the Lord now let's go to Joel Joel 2 Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been. If they're a people and the likes of them have never been, who do you think that's describing? It's not describing angels. They've always been. It's describing the church. There's never been a being like the church. Go look at all the descriptions of the church. Nor will there ever be any such after them. We are special and unique. The bride, even for many successive generations, a fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. I wonder if they were white horses or not. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. Remember Psalm 149? 
All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark and the star, stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. Camp of the saints, Revelation chapter 21, 20 or 21. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So, I don't know what we're supposed to see. I don't know where these people are getting this mistaken understanding. Thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about yet. I can clearly prove my point with scripture. It's right there. But then you got children that won't take the time to read the Bible and take a look at it. That they'll read it one time. I got it all figured out. No, you don't. You don't know anything. You need to go and take time to read this word. But don't go into the comment section and under false pretenses start a dialogue with somebody asking a legitimate question, but then start going and attacking them and call, t telling them they don't know what they're talking about. You don't know that person. You don't know what that person knows. Evidently, people don't click on people's icons and look at their channels. I do it to everybody I have a conversation with. I want to know more about them. The content on your channel tells, tells on you. Who you're subscribed to tells on you. What your playlist look like tells on you. Go to my channel and look at all my stuff and you'll see exactly what I'm about. I put it on my channel for everyone to see. I don't hide anything. For somebody to come up and say something like this, whoa, wait a second there, buddy. You're in a dangerous spot here. I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to what he actually believes in and who he's actually put his faith in. Because if that's his understanding, it doesn't sound like he believes in Jesus. It sounds like he's following Satan. He needs to fix himself. So, if Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 and Revelation 19 verses 11 through 16 are talking about the same person, why are the descriptions so completely different? completely different there's no correlation between these two individuals and besides Jesus doesn't come back at the beginning of the tribulation he comes back at the end so anyway guys rightly divide that's how you do it it's simple read the Bible compare the scriptures scripture proves scripture scripture doesn't deny scripture and when somebody starts to do that I take that personally you cannot take scripture and deny other scripture with it you cannot put scripture against scripture. All this scripture proves the other scripture. People that do that are heretics. They are taking something, trying to make their understanding right instead of proving all this stuff. And he never proved his point. Well, I just did mine. And I'll keep doing it. Because I'm really getting the impression and coming to the understanding that there are a lot of people out there who aren't doing this. People that are calling themselves Christians and saying they know the Bible. And they're not even taking the time to read this stuff. You can get mad at me all you want to. I don't care. The truth is the truth. If you're not, if you cannot go and tell people they're wrong if you're not reading the scriptures. Because how can you tell somebody you're wrong if you don't know what you're talking about? I've had people that didn't even know how to do auto mechanics tell me I was wrong. I've been an auto mechanic over 30 years. Small engine. Gasoline engine, diesel engine, motorcycle, aircraft. I work on everything. But I've had people tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, well, you, your car can stay broke and you can go pay a mechanic a couple of thousand dollars to fix it. I'll see you later. But, but people want to tell me I'm arrogant. That's the epitome of arrogance and narcissism. But they want to call me arrogant and prideful. Okay. Call me all the names you want. I don't care. I'm not doing this to impress you. I'm not doing this to impress anyone else. I'm doing this for one purpose and one purpose only. That's to serve my God. Because people are taking these scriptures and they're wringing them and twisting them and wrapping them together, tearing them and reconnecting them to make their own doctrine and they're deceiving the world with it. 
And the scariest thing isn't that they're doing it. The scariest thing is that genuine born-again believers are believing them because they won't read the Bible. They won't study the Word. Guys, I'll make it as easy as I can for you. When you come to my channel, you'll get links, you'll get uh, examples. I show you how to do this stuff. But if you don't take it and do something with it, it has done you no good. Just watching my video is not good enough. If you want to get rid of the problems in your life and be able to win these spiritual battles, you've got to do the work. Otherwise, you're going to get beat up and bashed in other people's combat sections. Or, like a lot of people are doing, you're going to go hide. And you're not going to engage in that stuff. You were not called to hide. You were not called to be timid and quiet and sit in the corner. We are at the height of battle. You were called to stand for what's true, to stand for what's right against these people who think they know something and they know nothing. And I just completely blew his argument out of the water with only scriptures out of two chapters. You give me something that you think means a certain thing and, and ask me to prove it, I'm going to prove it. But don't get mad when I prove it, which is what's happening right now with that guy and actually three other people. They ask me to prove my point. I prove my point. Then they get mad at me and call me names. I think that's hilarious. But luckily I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm doing this for the Lord. This is what he showed me. This is what he gave me. This is what he has instructed me and, and uh, trusted me with. And I'm going to make sure that I fulfill it as best I can. But I, I find it disturbing that so many Christians are so uneducated when it comes to the simple, the simple face value interpretation of the scripture. And the only way you get that is if you read it. You can't get it from other people. You can't get it from listening to me. You need to read it for yourself. That's the only way you're going to know this stuff. How do I know that? I read it. Go watch my videos. Look at the stuff that I've covered in videos. We've gone from Genesis to Revelation. I've covered almost... I've covered everything in the Bible. I've been in every single chapter in the Bible. I have playlists doing all the books from one to four chapters. I have playlists on specific books. I've gone through everything that the Bible has. I haven't, I haven't touched every subject, but I've covered everything that the Bible has. And... It's a simple face value interpretation. And the rightly dividing isn't you making it your opinion of what you think it means. Rightly dividing is comparing it with other scriptures. I just compared those scriptures. That's rightly dividing. But if this is the best people can do, why are you even talking? I've got a, over 1,600 videos proving myself. Go watch it. Here's another one, 1,601. This is just ludicrous and ridiculous. But amazingly, 2 Timothy, I covered it today. What was it? 2 Timothy 3? Or 2 Timothy 2? Something like that. Talks about this stuff. People calling themselves Christians and then going out there and doing that nonsense. That's ridiculous. But that's what we're dealing with. And that's why you have to be well armed. If you're not well armed, if you're not confident that you can stand in these kinds of battles, do not engage in them. All it's going to do is frustrate you, make you mad, and it's going to cause you to doubt yourself. And it's going to cause you to be self-condemned. Don't do that. Be prepared for battle first before you go into it. We don't take a, a, a farmer with no training and stick him in, in a Humvee and send him out there in the sector. He doesn't know what to do. He's not battle-hardened. He's not trained. He has to go. The, the training, just basic training, $64,000. That's the investment the Army puts in you when they train you. If you go to AIT, depending on the type of AIT, there's another 90000 added onto that. And every subsequent block of training you have, that's more price tag on there. By the time I was um, medically discharged from the Army, I was worth 286000 because of all the training that I had. I had training in all kinds of stuff. But I could not go to Iraq or Afghanistan until I was trained for it. I couldn't go into battle until I knew what I was doing. 
The same thing applies here in the spiritual battle. You cannot engage in spiritual battle unless you know what you're talking about. Do I get it right 100% of the time? Absolutely not. But I can sure go to scripture and read the scripture and compare them and look and see if I'm doing it right or wrong. But all I get is this stuff from other people. They don't want to prove their point, but they want to try to make me look bad. You're lost. You're not doing it. It's all high school insults. I've been through that. Did that years ago. So if you're going to make a case, prove it. Just like the video I shared earlier. If you're going to make a, and that, that community post, if you're going to make a case against me or make an accusation, prove your point. Don't just come and start spouting stuff off. Show me what you're talking about. Prove to me where I've made a mistake. And I'm more than happy to fix it. But until you prove it, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Call that pride, call that arrogance, call it being stubborn. I don't care. But the fact that I'm stubborn keeps me from being misled by other people. And many of those people are my, many of them are my supposed brothers and sisters. So you need to decide who you serve. And if you're going to engage in, in a debate with me, you better come armed with your scripture. And you better know what you're talking about. So Daniel, if you're watching, that this all is for you. You clearly have not read your scriptures. And if this wasn't good enough for you, I can't help you. You need to go talk to somebody who's got a degree uh, from Dallas Seminary or some other place. You need to go talk to somebody who's who you respect. Unless you just think you got it figured out for yourself, which clearly you didn't. Because the Bible very clearly describes two different people in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 19. That's all I got. Unless anybody has any other questions. Love you guys. See you in the next one.